Uh, my name is Dave, and I am from London, which is why I look very, very tired. Uh, well, that's my excuse anyway, um, having flown over yesterday. So I've been using NoSQL for quite a while. Um, I started the Cassandra Meetup group back in 2010. Um, and I've used, I've used Cassandra quite a bit sort of from then on. Uh, I still, still run the London Meetup group. And I work for a company called Halo, um, who aren't launched on the West Coast yet. So you may not have heard of them. So Halo is a, a taxi app. And it basically is a way that you can get a licensed taxi to come pick you up uh, by pressing one button on your phone. So this gives you a sort of overview of the features of Halo. Um, on the far left, where you can see the cabs around you. You can press the pick me up here button, and then you'll see who's going to come and get you. You'll know who they are. You'll, you'll know what their number plate is. You can press a button to ring them. Um, and at the end of the ride, you can just get out of the cab. The taxi will automatically charge your card for the amount, um, so you don't have to mess about with kind of paying the guy. Um, and then you'll get an email or a seat. So that's kind of Halo in a nutshell. Some facts about Halo to sort of give some context to the talk. Uh, Halo is the, the world's highest rated taxi app. We've got over 10,000 five-star reviews. Um, and we've got over half a million uh, registered customers now. We've launched in a bunch of cities. We started off in London, and we've spread out to places like Dublin, um, Madrid, Barcelona in Europe. And then over to the US, we've, we were in uh, New York, Boston, Chicago, uh, and up in Canada, Toronto. So we're kind of spreading out. We, we, haven't, made it, we haven't made it across to the, uh, to the West Coast yet, but it is on the, it is on the plans. Um, oh, yeah, and I forgot about Tokyo as well. We're in Tokyo and Osaka as well, we're launching in. So Halo, Halo is growing. Um, we haven't been around that long. We've been around about 18 months. Um, and in that time, we've already uh, grown in terms of the number of cities. We've grown in terms of the number of passengers, uh, the number of jobs done, the number of drivers on our network, the number of, uh, you know, you name it, we're, we're growing basically in a lot of different dimensions. Um, and so these, this kind of growth um, presents some challenges. So what's the talk about? Well, I'm going to go back to kind of basics and just say, why, why did Halo choose to use NoSQL technologies? You know, what was behind that decision? Um, and and to give you a flavor of, uh, of what the thinking was. I'm then going to talk about two of the kind of NoSQL technologies that we're using. Um, we're heavily invested in Cassandra, so I'm going to talk about how we use Cassandra. Um, and we'll talk about kind of the, the use cases and what our setup looks like. And then I'm going to talk about Kudu Analytics, which is uh, a kind of NoSQL analytics um, solution that's built on top of Cassandra. And then finally, I'm going to kind of round off with some, some stuff about some of the challenges of, of running NoSQL in, in an organization uh, and some of the things that we found um, difficult that, that we've had to sort of work to overcome. So first things first, what, why should you choose NoSQL? This, was, this is a quote from Andy Gross, who's um, the, one of the lead engineers on React. And he, he, gave, he gave this talk uh, a couple of years ago now, probably, in, in London. And he said that NoSQL DBs trade off traditional features to better support new and emerging use cases. And I think this is a good kind of way of summing up no sequel. And I think the key, the key word here is the kind of trade-off, basically. Uh, we're making trade-offs. And this kind of resonated with me um, at the time when I saw this talk. I thought that's a very good way of putting it. So what sort of things do you trade off when you choose NoSQL? You're trading off more widely used and tested software. So the NoSQL solutions, um, Cassandra seems relatively uh, mature now compared to when I started using it. But it's still quite a young technology compared to uh, something like MySQL that's been around a lot longer. Um, you're going to be, you're probably going to be trading off ad hoc querying. Most of the, uh, mem well, many of the NoSQL technologies don't you know, provide a more limited set of um, sort of querying capabilities for the database. Um, and then finally, talent pool with direct experience. You're going to be trading that off because when you come to hire engineers, you're you're going to struggle. Not struggle, but you're probably not going to find someone who's actually used the technology that you used before. Um, so these are the sorts of things that you're going to be giving away. So what sort of stuff do you get back? Well, these are kind of three headlines for me. Um, I mean, there are other things as well, but 
high availability, scalability, and operational simplicity are the things that, that I find attractive in the NoSQL stores. Um, and they're the sorts of things that, that led Halo to want to adopt NoSQL. And I'll, I'll go into that in a bit more detail. So this is, this is how we ended up adopting NoSQL at Halo. When we launched in 2011, uh, we were running on AWS. We're still running on AWS. And we were running in one region, and we were in a few availability zones. Um, and we, we basically had three applications. We had two PHP MySQL web apps, and we had some Java services that kind of did some of the heavy lifting. And the whole thing had been built reasonably quickly by a team of sort of three or four engineers. And we had some resilience in our data store because we, we were using the MySQL multi-master setup. So if one of the MySQL boxes died, we could, we could continue operating. So what, what drove us to adopt Cassandra? Well, pre-launch, the focus of Halo was all about features. We needed to get the features done. We needed to get the basic app working such that we could launch. After we'd launched, we realized that we wanted Halo to become a utility. So we wanted it so that whenever you needed to get a taxi, you could pull out your phone, press a button, taxi was going to come and get you. We didn't want to be saying to people, we are down for scheduled maintenance, or I'm sorry, the database is unavailable at this time. We wanted people to be, be able to rely on Halo to get them a cab at all times of the day. Um, we had plans for international expansion, and we wanted a single app. So what we wanted to be able to happen was that you would, you would get a taxi to Heathrow, get on a plane to New York, get off at JFK, and you'd be able to pick, pull out your app, press a button, and a taxi comes and gets you. And we wanted some of locality of data to go with that. So we wanted it so that when you're in New York, you're going to be running out of a data center in the US. When you're in London, you'd be running out of a data center in, uh, in London. Um, so we wanted this kind of global expansion, uh, and, and we wanted so we basically wanted to spread our data around the world. We had expected growth. Um, we, wanted, we wanted a data store that wasn't going to impede us, that we could kind of not worry too much about growth. So Cassandra gives us that because it, it kind of scales linearly. And, and actually, we don't have an enormous transaction volume. Um, but we wanted to pick something that it was not going to constrain us in the future. And then finally, prior experience. I, I had some experience with Cassandra before I joined Halo. And so that familiarity uh, that sort of fed into the decision-making process as well. We adopted it largely you know, as a sort of unilateral developers just getting on with things approach. Um, this was when we, we, were, we were building Halo on a, on a boat in the Thames in London, um, all of us in one little room. Um, so what we did was we kind of took the bits of the app that we knew we wanted to be global, and we, we broke the functionality down, and we sort of moved to a more services sort of architecture. Um, and we, we built the services so that they talked to Cassandra. That, and then we swapped them in for the, for the old functionality. So that's kind of how we, how we migrated onto Cassandra. And we launched our Cassandra-backed services in 2012. And we had a sort of gradual rollout, first of all to do North America, and then eventually to, to do London and Dublin as well. Um, and now all of our systems, um, are, all of our systems on uh, on the kind of customer side, um, are, are all using Cassandra, and we're migrating more to it. So Cassandra Halo. For another talk, I did about Cassandra. I went around and I, I asked a bunch of people in the company what they thought about Cassandra. This was the kind of developer view that there's a view that it just kind of works. You can you can use it. Um, and, and you just don't really need to think about it. Um, this is actually quite different from the early days of Cassandra, where it would not do that. <laughs> uh, but nowadays, it's, it seems to be pretty reliable, and, and people find it very easy just to, just to get on with it. Um, the other feeling from the development team is that you have, to, you have to invest a little bit more up front with Cassandra. So as a developer, especially someone who's not pro potentially not used Cassandra before, you have to spend a little bit more time thinking about your data, thinking about your data model, and actually doing the programming work to get this thing, you know, your, your thing that you're building out the door. But once you've done it, um, the deployment story is really easy. So you, know, you, you can deploy your service within Halo, and you know that it'll just work, because the database is on three continents, and, and it'll just work. So these are the kind of use cases. Um, th these, are, these are two of the use cases of Halo that, that, that really kind of power what we do. The first one is um, the entity storage. So we store all of our customer records in Cassandra. So when you use the app, we'll look up your customer details from Cassandra. 
and we store it in one column family called customers. And we have a, a row key, which is the, the big number, which is kind of your unique identifier as a, um, as a customer. And then we have columns and values. So this, this looks a bit like, you can imagine putting this in a relational database. Um, every row looks pretty much the same. Um, they've all got the same columns. Every, you know, every row will have the same set of columns, just different values. Um, and every row has got a unique identifier, like a primary key. So this is, um, this is kind of the first use case. The main considerations for entity storage in terms of using it correctly is to, when you update a row, just update the columns that you've changed. Because the thing you want to kind of avoid with Cassandra is reading, all, reading a, a bunch of data, modifying it, and then writing it all back. With Cassandra, you want to be mutating individual columns. So you want to be saying, change this particular thing to this value. Because if you do that, you're going to avoid race conditions. Um, and you're going to avoid kind of uh, overwriting someone else's changes. This is another use case. So this is quite different. This is kind of time series. Um, and this use case is perfect for when you've got measurements or you know, things that are immutable actions that are occurring. So in this example, we're storing a record of every time we send uh, communications to customers. Uh, this is sort of you know, for customer services or, or for individuals to, to find out what, you know, what's, what's gone on. So in this use case, you can see the row key here is a day. It's a, it's a date, 2013-06-01. Um, and the columns, the names of the columns now are, are, are UUIDs, and they're actually time-based UUIDs, so they've got a time component within them. And Cassandra will understand this time component, will actually order the columns uh, according to time. So what you end up with is you end up with one row per day, and you end up with one column per email sent, basically, um, within that day. So this is, um, this is a bit of a departure. This kind of shows the, the, the different where, where, where Cassandra starts to kind of diverge from a, a, a sort of a relational store. Because in this instance, we haven't got a consistent set of columns in every row. In fact, the columns are all very different. Um, the names of the columns are a useful piece of information. They're actually the ID. You, know, you wouldn't design a MySQL um, schema where your, where your column names were an ID. That would be insane. Because you'd have to do alter table every time you added someone. But in Cassandra, you can. So, so this is a good example. And to build on this, um, this is a, another index on the same data. So as well as storing an overall view of what we've sent to everyone, we also have a, another index, which is kind of like what we've sent to an individual person. So in this case, you can see I've changed a row key. That's the only thing that's changed here, the row key. So now the row key is an email address. So what we're doing here is we're storing everything that we've sent to a particular person under one row. Um, you, what we're actually doing here is that when we, when we write the data to the database, we write it twice. We write it in two places. We're denormalizing the data on, at the time of write in order to satisfy two different read requirements. So we've got two ways we want to read back the data. And with Cassandra, what we're doing is we're actually storing the data in two different ways to satisfy both of those query patterns. So this is kind of a, a Cassandra pattern, basically. You store the data as many times as you need to, to satisfy your, re your requirements on read. The main consideration for kind of time series storage is to just pick a decent row key. Um, if you had millions and billions and billions of things happening, you wouldn't want to store them under a single day because you'd have too many of them. Um, you might break it down so that you had a 10-minute bucket or something like that. That's the main consideration. In terms of client libraries, we're using Java, um, PHP, and Go. So we're using Astyanax, which is the Netflix library. We're using PHP Casa, and we're using Gossy for Go. We're not yet using the CQL3 kind of brand of, um, of, of driver, which are quite new for Cassandra. Um, these are kind of the, the old school thrift ones, but, but we kind of like all of them, and th they're pretty easy to use. This gives you an idea of like where, where we are in the world and with Halo, and it, and it kind of gives you an idea as to how far away everything is. Um, the latency between um, the Asia region and London is about 350 milliseconds, so that wouldn't be acceptable to run. You know, if we only had one database and it was in London, the Tokyo app just basically wouldn't work. Um, it would be too slow. So this is, um, this is kind of like one of the main reasons we, 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 you know, that Cassandra works for us. It's very, very easy to distribute your database all over the world. And this is actually what, what Cassandra at Halo looks like. The yellow dots are machines on AWS. Um, 
and we're running two different clusters of Cassandra, uh, six machines per region and three different regions. So we're in AP Southeast 1, US East 1, and EU West 1. And the little sort of gray dotted arrowed lines are the uh, VPN links doing asynchronous replication between the regions. So what happens is, when, I, when you get out in New York and you, you need, we need to get your customer record, that will be serviced from the US data center. And any changes will be written to the US data center, but then asynchronously replicated off to the other data centers. So this is great because um, we, we, can, we can actually withstand the loss of a region for our, for our Cassandra-backed services. If the entire US region disappeared, we could, we could serve the traffic out of London with extra latency. Um, but, but we could still do it. And we have actually done this on occasion. Um, normally, when someone messes up and they kill, kill uh, you know, a bunch of stuff in one region, we can just quickly flip the DNS. Um, We're running M1 large machines at the moment. We've provisioned IOPS EBS. This isn't really a recommended thing to do. Um, and we're currently looking at other ways of configuring our cluster. Um, the, the sort of recommended practice for Cassandra is to run off ephemeral, you know, if you're on AWS, to run off ephemeral disks. So we're, we're looking at switching to that. We might switch to SSDs and just have less of them. Um, there's a famous kind of um, blog post from Netflix where they basically said that they switched from having uh, sort of, you know, 20 machines running, uh, running Cassandra with memcache in front of it, and they moved on to SSDs, and then they could basically run sort of six machines with no memcache. Um, and that's probably where we'll end up going, because it makes life a lot easier if you don't have to worry about cache, cache coherency. Especially with a global setup, it's quite difficult to do kind of global cache coherency. So if you don't need to bother, then it's great. <coughs> Multi-DC with Cassandra is just fantastic. It's so easy to get set up and running. You know, we started off in one data center, we built a new data center, and then just kind of connect them, and they just work. Um, I, I remember Adrian giving a talk about this, and he was saying it was like taking off in a 747 or something, and then upgrading it mid-flight, and then landing in the, I don't know. He had some, he, 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 was, he was giving some talk about how, how, how mind-blowing it is that you can take a live running database, and then just add a whole other region, and it just works. Um, we run um, Op Center, which is a free data stacks thing, which I always include just because it's like it's just worth doing because it gives you a, a pretty picture of your ring and it gives you lots of useful tools for managing the cluster. So the second um, kind of NoSQL technology I'm going to go through is Akuma Analytics, which we're kind of uh, starting to use more and more. So when we, when we switch everything to Cassandra, there's one type of query that we, we lose the ability to do um, it, compared to, say, the, the data that we've got in MySQL. And that's kind of this, this, this kind of analytical queries. Um, if you know any, any SQL, the kind of queries where you're saying select count this, sum this, the average of this, and potentially like group by something. So you just, you just can't, um, you can't easily do those things with raw Cassandra. So what we did was, um, Back in, shortly after I joined Halo, actually, we started to design a system so that when we moved to Cassandra, we'd still be able to do this stuff. And we started building our own kind of analytical system in front of Cassandra. Um, and that was quite hard work, and we didn't do a brilliant job about it. And then luckily, Akunu kind of opened, uh, released this tool, so we, we switched to using that. So what Akunu gives us is it gives us this ability to do these queries back. So if you, you basically define pre-planned pre query templates, um, and then Akunu, what, what it will do is it will denormalize on write such that you can conduct queries like that. Our setup looks a bit like this. Everything that happens in Halo, we turn into an event, which is just a set of keys and values, um, a kind of map. And, and these are generated both in the app and uh, you know, on the servers. A basically, anywhere that anything happens that we're interested in, we generate these events. And then we farm them all into a queue system called NSQ that Bitly created um, in Go specifically to do this task, basically. They, they, were, they were looking to do a very similar thing, which was kind of analytical, um, an analytical, you know, an analytic, anal analytical event stream. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic tool, is, is NSQ. From NSQ, we feed them into Akunu, and Akunu stores the data in Cassandra. And then we can do things like this. So for anyone who's got experience of Cassandra, you'll know that you, you, would, you wouldn't be able to do this with, with, with just raw Cassandra. Um, so we, we can kind of, this is an example where we're summing up our accept rate. 
So we can basically take one type of event, which is an allocation event where we offer it out to a driver. So every job kind of gets offered to each driver and they can either accept or decline it or just ignore it. And we can kind of count up how many times that happens. Um, and we can do things like group by day and, or group by minute. So it's, it gives us quite a lot of um, power. Uh, and then we can do things like we can draw graphs. So this shows um, the, the, blue, the blue graph kind of shows um, customer demand. You can see how spiky our demand is. Obviously, like rush hour in London, everyone wants to get a cab. <coughs> and this is another example from our testing system um, showing the number of drivers on shift. So the top, the top graph is quite interesting because the way that Halo works is that drivers send us their location updates about every five seconds. So every driver pings as their location. So we have this event stream, which is like 500 to 2,000 odd events per second uh, of drivers sending in their updates. Uh, and what we do is we, we just simply stick it all into Akunu, and then we can say, select the count distinct of the driver ID, group by minute. And what that basically gives us is how many drivers were active at that time of the day, which is pretty cool. And you can just draw a little graph of it. Uh, and below, there's like a heat map, which is kind of built in as well. So the challenges. Um, this is kind of a big one. Experience. Team members are not normally, I don't think there's any exception to this rule actually. Every team member who's joined Halo has not used Cassandra before. We now have 50 engineers. Um, none of them had ever used Cassandra before. So there are challenges there. The main challenge is, I think, that it's e very easy to shoot yourself in the foot with, with a MySQL database or you know, any SQL database. You can index it badly. You can design your schema badly. You can end up in a situation where your queries will run OK for the first week of operation when there's kind of 100 rows and then gradually implode. But an engineer who's had kind of you know, a, a reasonable amount of experience will often just naturally avoid those pitfalls because they've got experience using the tools. Whereas with Cassandra, because people haven't got that experience, they can sometimes shoot themselves in the foot um, doing things badly. So, so that's a challenge. And, and one of the things we've tried to do to get around that is, is kind of educate. So we have internal, um, internal talks about Cassandra, and we explain how it works to people when they join. And we, we kind of try and do things like peer reviewing data models. So we, have a, we, we try and put a lot of energy, basically, into kind of mitigating this, um, this, this, this risk. Um, and the risk is that people will use Cassandra terribly and then it will blow up in their face. Um, this is kind of the second challenge. This is, um, this is quite an interesting one. This, when, when I went round for, for a previous talk and asked um, everyone in the company what they thought of Cassandra, uh, when I went to management, the management team, and asked them, this was kind of their main, main response. They had, this, they had this fear that we put all of our data into this database that we couldn't get it back out of. That was their perception of Cassandra. Um, and actually, it's not really true. There are lots of ways you can get your data out of Cassandra. I mean, to, uh, to start with, we, we have no problem getting data out of it for, for, for kind of you know, the, the actual apps um, because of the way we use Cassandra. We, we, you know, you denormalize on write, you prepare for the ways you want to read it, you read it back, it's fine, it works great. I think what this came down to was, it came down to kind of ad hoc requests for information. I would almost think of it as like debugging. When, when things go a bit wrong and you're sort of, when you know, someone will come and say, right, we need to get all the customers who registered between these two times, um, you know, who, who's, whose account has these particular characteristics. And to do that when you've got 500,000 rows in Cassandra is not that easy, you know, because it's not something we've designed for up front. Uh, and Cassandra is, is really wanting you to denormalize on right. So there are ways of solving it. Um, the kind of normal way of solving it is you can use Hadoop and you can plug that directly into Cassandra and you can write a MapReduce job, which is uh, obviously insane and painful. But you can also plug in things like Hive. Um, Datastax have a, an enterprise product where you can run basically a, a kind of integrated Hive on top of Cassandra. So you can literally just type an SQL-like query and press enter and it will go and deal with it all. And it's that, we don't have that, so it's that kind of ease of of doing those exploratory queries that, that we miss. Um, and, and I think it's and I think it's also possibly the fact that engineers in the company will use it as a bit of an excuse. So uh, fundamentally we don't you know often 
management come and tap you on the shoulder and say, can you just get all this data for me? And you're like, not really, I'm you know, busy with work. Um, but with Cassandra, you can kind of say, no, actually, I can't. You know, it's genuinely impossible. Not, you know, uh, whereas with MySQL, you kind of felt a bit silly saying that. So I, I think there's a few different, a few different things ar around this. Um, and this is something we're kind of working hard to change. The next challenge with, with kind of NoSQL is that it's easy to, I think it's easy to cause yourself a big data problem. So this is an example uh, where we, we, we stored every single point that every driver ever sent. And this is about, this is like a small subset. We must have three or four billion points now. Um, and this is kind of like a few million of them. And we just got them all out of the database and then we just drew them you know, on a canvas. And lo and behold, because drivers generally drive on roads, it plots a map of London just from the data that they're sending us. So you can kind of see the, um, this is London, you can kind of see the Thames, you can see um, the, the you know, Hyde Park and Richmond Park, not Richmond Park, the other one, uh, the other park. Yeah, that one. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's easy, I think with NoSQL, it's kind of easy to, to get into this habit of like, oh, we can just, you know, we can store everything, it's technically possible. We'll have, you know, hundreds of nodes and we'll store all this data and we'll, we'll throw it all in there without really having an idea as to what you're, you're actually trying to do with the data. Um, and this is a pretty picture, but we don't really need this to run our business. So this is another challenge, I think, of NoSQL, which is kind of avoiding the, the, that kind of like hoarding mentality of I'm just going to hoard everything. Storage is cheap, but it's not actually that cheap. You know, once you start adding lots of AWS nodes, you give Amazon a large wheelbarrow of money every month. So you need to kind of keep that in mind. So the lessons learned, um, the sorts of things that we've taken away from our adoption of NoSQL. I think having an advocate is really important. If, you know, if, you're, if you're investing, if you're taking on a new, a new NoSQL database in your organization, you need to have someone whose job it is to kind of sell that internally. So when people start, you can sell it to them and say, look, this is good. You know, this is how you use it. Because um, if you don't do that, then they, they, they'll, they'll join the company, they'll use it badly, and then they'll become disaffected with it. Um, you definitely need to teach people the fundamentals because people are going to come into your organization with no experience. So you need to kind of address that. You need to, you need to get them up to the level where they can feel comfortable using it. Um, so, so we have regular kind of um, re regular sort of internal seminars on, on Cassandra, and we, we try and put a lot of effort into kind of learning it. The other lesson is don't store stuff for the sake of it. <laughs> you know, do it if you need it, basically. Um, explain trade-offs in choosing NoSQL. This is, this is quite an interesting one. So the other, uh, the management perception of Cassandra was they didn't, they weren't really sure why we, you know, why we'd chosen it. We didn't explain it well enough, and we, we should have done a better job of explaining what we were doing, why we were choosing it, and the trade-offs involved in that decision. And then finally, kind of provide solutions. I think that's this is a really important one. Um, as a kind of developer, we we provided a solution to the problems that we directly had, which was we wanted to run Halo you know, on three continents to power the app. But we'd kind of neglected some other people in the business who were able to use the data in MySQL. And once we'd switched, we didn't give them a way of doing some of the things they used to be doing. So we, we kind of, we, we actually made the overall system you know, have less features. You know, they couldn't do something they could do. So what we should have done is we should have, we should have kind of, um, you know, we should have put more energy, basically. We should have, we should have provided a solution for that. We, we should have figured out how, how when people needed to get 20 rows out of the database, matching some criteria, we should have had a way of them doing that easily, and we didn't. So finally, and just quickly in conclusion, uh, we like Cassandra at Halo, because it's, it's got a really solid design principle. Um, it's got HA characteristics, and you can just run it globally really easily. It's a very easy thing to deploy and operate. It's very operationally simple. All the nodes are the same. There's no special master nodes. They're just all identical. So it's very easy from an operational perspective to run this thing. The future for Cassandra is that we're going to continue to invest in Cassandra. Um, we are migrating more and more of our stuff off from MySQL onto Cassandra, mainly due to the multi-region and it's just uh, simplicity of operations side. We're going to try and hire some people with experience running Cassandra. This is quite hard work, actually. We've been trying to do that for about three months now. This comes back to the talent pool thing. Maybe we should just hire someone and get them to learn it. I don't know. Um, we're going to focus on expanding our reporting facilities and that sort of debug thing. Um, and then we're basically just going to grow. We're going to launch in the West Coast so that you'll be able to actually get you know, taxi via Halo uh, when you're in San Jose. 
um, and we're going to grow engineering teams in NYC, Asia, and London. Right, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Right at the back. We're still switching, and we started about a year and a half ago, so quite a while. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't something we were you know, aggressively pursuing at that time. Um, I think the aim now is to switch a lot of the rest of the stuff by the end of November. So we're kind of we're pursuing it a bit more aggressively now. Yeah, so sometimes people would write a little Python script that kind of iterated over all the rows, but it, it would be very slow and you know, it's not, not suboptimal, basically. Um, I think that the normal way you do reporting with Cassandra is that you'd have another data center that is a reporting data center. You put one replica in that data center and then you run you know, some kind of hadoop map MapReduce thing on top of it. So it's just a case of us getting that set up, basically. We, haven't, we just haven't invested the time to get that set up. I think if we did it, it would, it would make everyone's life a lot easier. So it's probably something we'll be doing. Yeah, that's the normally the way you do it, because then your reporting data, your sort of workload for reporting doesn't impact the, the sort of workload for the, you know, the transactional app flow. Yep. You mentioned um, trying to build your UUIDs. Are these are uh, global UUIDs that you guys generate that yeah. have a, whatever the uh, sequence is will automatically find for it? Yeah, so they're, it's, um, they're type 4 UUIDs, um, and they have a time component. So I think okay. the type 1s are pure random. Type 4s have got a, type, a time component in them. Uh, and cause, uh, and it, it, it's a bit messed up because they actually reverse the bits, so you, they don't, it's not a natural ordering. Yeah, but Cassandra does all that for you. So with Cassandra, you just say, yeah, this thing is a time-based UID, and then it will know that, and it will automatically order them in the right way. So that's pretty cool. And what's the resolution of that that you guys use? Or is that, um, given that you're global, but these are GUIDs. They're GUIDs, but if you generate two at exactly the same time, they'll still be unique, because only a part of it's time-based. It's also unique in your server or whatever. Yeah, it's got other bit. It's got more. It's got more bits in it, basically. Some of them aren't to do with time. Yeah. Right. Last question. Go on. Yeah, that's the plan. The vision is is certainly to 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 grow ha uh, Halo beyond a uh, taxi network, and and so. Not 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 necessarily no. Um, the kind of the re some of the other decisions in the architecture are are based on that. Um, you know, kind of SOI approach, trying to make reusable chunks of services and stuff. But the Cassandra decision was really the multi-region thing. Really, was a big a big selling point. All right. If anyone's got any more questions, they can grab me after. Thanks very much, everyone.